Welcome back to the Sports Not interview, everybody. Scott Branson with you, and we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite sporting events in all of sports, and that, of course, is the Kentucky Derby. The 150th running of the Kentucky Derby is happening down at Churchill Downs, and to talk about that with us, we welcome Steve Bick. He hosts at the races every weekday at 9 a.m. Eastern time on Sirius XM this Saturday. He's going to host a special three-hour pre-race show live from Churchill Downs starting at 2 p.m. Eastern leading into the Kentucky Derby broadcast, which is airing on Sirius XM Channel 85. And uh, we can see the spires there behind if you're if you're watching us. And, uh, Steve, I'll tell you what, you get into this race, of course, we know fierceness is the favorite coming in. He was dominant in the Florida Derby, the race that's given us 25 Kentucky Derby winners, uh, three wins out of his first five starts, but there is some inconsistencies. Is there any reason to be concerned going in? What do you think about fierceness and this race coming up on Saturday? Well, it, it, there's there's always reasons to be concerned, even if even if a horse comes in and looks looks indomitable. Uh, the two losses that that he has suffered have raised all the questions that you're hearing about, you know, whether he is, is the quote unquote real thing. I mean, he's, he's the real thing. That's not an issue. The question is, is he a horse that can withstand pressure and things not necessarily going his way? Uh, he certainly benefited from the draw being outside. He's got, you know, Johnny Velasquez is a, a rider that goes forward. As long as he breaks well, uh, he, he should find a good position. He doesn't necessarily have to have the lead. He didn't have the lead in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Uh, he didn't immediately have the lead in, in the Florida Derby, but he, he does have to be well positioned. There is speed to his inside that is probably going to go, track Phantom and Dornick. Uh, and so John Velasquez should be able to put him in an ideal position. Uh, it, it, I won't even say if he's good enough, mm. because we know he's good enough based on the juvenile and on the Florida Derby performance. Uh, it, it's really a question if anything goes wrong early in particular, or if you get a horse or two that suddenly jump into the pace fray and add to the pace and, and basically make him go faster than, than he wants. He happens to be a horse whose greatest strength is making others chase. Mm. So, the, you know, you could see a scenario where John Velasquez, if, if it feels like he's starting to get pressure, Johnny may go ahead, it may force his hand, but then at the same time, he is such a, a smooth, efficient, front-running horse, he'll make everybody else chase. And, and those have been the scenarios that have seen him romp to that juvenile win and to the Florida Derby win. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of people were dismayed. I mean, the Champagne Stakes, I think it was 20 lengths uh, for him, the loss there. But you talked about having having people chase, having making horses chase him. What other strengths is it or what is it about fierceness as you for the folks who have not seen him run that makes him so special in addition to that? Well, that, that's what it is. It, it, it's a high cruising speed. Mm. And when you think about uh, the, the easiest comparisons, are the Bob Baffert horses that that win the same way, and you know, horses' greatest asset is its speed. And they talk. Everybody, you know, talks about oh, getting him to rate on the lead. You, it, there's no point when you've got a free running horse that is naturally fast. You, you don't you don't want to restrain that horse. You, you want to get what they say, give them their head, let them relax. Because that's how they're, that's when they're at their most efficient and their most comfortable. And they're going to put pressure on the horses chasing them because his rate of speed is faster than those that are, are behind him. He's going to make them uncomfortable. If he does that, he'll, he'll win on Saturday. Nice. Yeah. And I know we, we go to Sierra Leone now, who's the, the, the second favorite here at three to one, I believe, the last time I checked. Um, described really as a super looking, just impeccably, impeccably br uh, bred horse, more of a late closer. Talk about that horse and how you see Sierra Leone coming into uh, this one against fierceness. Well, Sierra Leone and what makes him what makes it interesting in terms of the two favorites 
here you've got a horse that that has to be on the point, has to be on the lead, or or certainly you know in, in close contact, and then you've got a horse that's going to basically have to pass them all, and and he's going to have to pass them all. The way he drew inside, it, chances are mm. horses are going to become dropping down. The rest of that field who have better early foot than he does, essentially, you know, he's going to be shuffled back. Uh, and so he's going to be 19th or 20th, depending on what Catching Freedom does and how he mm. breaks. But, I mean, the two of them figure to be 19th and 20th early in this race. <coughs> Excuse me. No, that's uh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. From that point, it, it's strictly a matter of, <clears throat> it's strictly a matter of how how good of a trip can be worked out. You, you figure he'll save plenty of ground. That part, that you know, which is valuable, uh, he's going to save ground. But it, it, you, 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 in this race, you're going to have horses that are backing up in front and you know into his face. So you got to avoid you got to avoid those horses that are, you know, they're coming back at you. Then you've got horses that are. You know, going to be moving inside and out. I think everybody that's uh, watching has probably seen the overhead views of derbies, and you you see how <coughs> jocks are trying to find position for their run. When you're a when you're a late runner, you're compromising. You, the potential to be compromised is always there, and it, it all it takes is for a, a seam to close, a hole, uh, you know, a hole to close up or tighten up, and and the late running horse has to more or less pause, pause, pause. That can be the difference in winning or losing a derby very easily. And, yeah, that, and that's what the, Sierra Leone faces. That's what he faces, yeah. And if you look at winners and losers, for folks out there maybe who are casual watchers, when you talk about the post positions in this race particularly, talk about winners, losers here, horses that maybe came in that you liked, but because of the post position, they face challenges, just like you mentioned with Sierra Leone. Well, there's really, I, 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 unless unless you were, of, of horses, <laughs> Of horses that that had some intrigue, that were not obvious candidates, probably resilience. Uh, the Bill Mott candidate, probably resilience. The Wood winner, he probably got hurt the most being in the 19 hole. Uh, Stronghold, Stronghold, who won the Santa Anita Derby. He's in the 18, and I like Stronghold a little bit because he's got a, a certain tenacity to him. Uh, he's a horse that can sit third or fourth, basically stalk, so he can more or less get in behind Fierceness as Fierceness moves down the stretch, find a you know basically find a spot uh, to get comfortable, probably probably fifth, sixth, seventh. So I don't even though he did not draw great, I don't think Stronghold is as compromised. Uh, th there's really very few others. I mean, okay. th really, other than Dornick, uh, who yeah. drew the rail, uh, right. he was probably going to go forward anyway. They tried to they tried to rate him. I talked earlier about rating horses with speed. They tried that in the bluegrass. It was a disaster. So Danny Gargan, he's going to send Dornick. They have no choice now. Um, but they were going to go anyway. So. I don't think it hurts him. So I, there, there really is nobody else that was compromised by the draw. Good to hear. Uh, when you look at this race, too, I mean, we talk about the favorites, but uh, what are some of the sleeper candidates in this race that you're keeping your eye on that you've seen that could make a move, maybe surprise us? Well, it, it, there's, a ve there's a very nice big group of, of horses that are going to be, by the time odds close uh, at post time on Saturday, there's a few horses between eight to one and probably as high as 20 to one that, that are very eligible to win. Um, you know, the, everybody is focused on fierceness for, for good reason. He, he's run the two fastest races coming into this that any of these horses have run, you know, the, between the, the Florida Derby, if you want to use buyer figures, the, the 110 buyer, uh, the 105 in the Breeders' Cup is a two-year-old. I, I mean, those are figures that nobody else has even approached. Uh, the Japanese candidate, Forever Young, who, who is a 
who who has run fast, but it, it, it has questions for other reasons. Uh, you know, these, these are horses that at, at lower odds, people are going to try to beat. So you go looking for those other candidates that are going to get trips that you can project will work. So horses like uh, Just a Touch from Brad Cox coming out of the two runner-up performances in the Gotham and in the Bluegrass. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to win every start. You, you don't have to come here undefeated. Uh, you know, one of the great... One of the great mistakes that players make is, you know, having number one a recency bias. What did they do last time? And and also a, a win happy mentality. Well, that that horse he hasn't won since his maiden race. Okay, <laughs> what were the circumstances around those races? Just the touch is coming in here. This is his fourth career start. By all rights. By all rights, you'd, you'd prefer a horse that's more seasoned, that's had five, maybe six starts. Starting in the Derby, your fourth career start, going a distance you've never gone, it's a lot to ask. He is a justify. He has every right to like the trip. And he's a horse that stayed on beautifully in the bluegrass, attending a fast pace. Sierra Leone got past him late. But second out of the Gotham, second out of the Bluegrass, he's going to be anywhere from 10 to 14 to 1. He absolutely can win, and, and he's going to be on my tickets. Honor Marie is another horse that ha has faced has faced a series of, of you know, top-level competition when you look at, at the races that he ran in New Orleans at Fairgrounds over the winter. The Risen Star, the top five finishers from the Risen Star all are in this race. Uh, including Sierra Leone. Uh, it, Honor Marie ha has the benefit of having run here three times. He's got two wins, including the stake win in the Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, so I mean, here's a horse that you know is proven over the racetrack. Uh, in fact, there's a total of seven horses that have won at Churchill coming wow. into the Derby. Uh, so Honor Marie, uh, who's going to be my pick, I committed to him I committed to him two months ago, so <laughs> my tendency my tendency is to stick with with that initial uh, lean. But yeah. Honor Marie, and he's going to be a nice price. Uh, you know, for me, that's the kind of horse I always like. Ten to one, twelve to one, fourteen yeah. to one as a key horse. You're going to put him in first, second, and third. You're going to bet him in in the top three slots with another five or six horses all around him. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's two right there. Um, People will make a case for catching freedom, yep. but he's got the same issues that he's facing mm -hmm. coming, having to pass everybody essentially uh, you know, because he's going to be back there with Sierra Leone. Uh, so I, I, you know, I don't want to put too many closers for those that are, for those that like to understand the way this race is run, go and look, pull up the charts of, of Reese, not just recent Kentucky derbies, any Kentucky derby, look at the positioning of the horses after a mile and an eighth, mm. because at least two, most often three, horses that are first, second, third, or fourth at the eighth pole, those horses are going to be in the superfecta. Yeah. That, that doesn't change year to year. So instead of trying to figure out, well, who's going to win at 10 furlongs, figure out who's going to be in front at the eighth pole because that is going to give you two thirds or three quarters of the top finishers. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons that you, you want to look at a horse that, that is going to be sitting in the right position around the turn horses that are maybe 12th, 13th, 14th that have, that are making their move and they're going to be maybe fourth, fifth at the, you know, approaching the eighth hole. They get in the number all the time. That's the best way to approach this. That's awesome. What what uh, great, great information for all of us. We certainly appreciate that, the education. Before we let you go, because uh, we know how busy you are, Steve, uh, let me ask you about Bob Baffert. I mean, you know, the suspension. Uh, did Do you think Churchill Downs went too far on that and, and I mean, extending the extension? And when is he going to be reinstated? You know, this is the biggest race of the year. Obviously, you look at Baffert and he's won the Derby six times as a trainer. Uh, what what happens next with him? Well, I, ideally, <clears throat> ideally, uh, Bob Baffert and and 
Bill Carstangen of Churchill get a chance uh, in in coming months to sit down and and to to end uh, this ban. Uh, it it did feel that extending the two years to a third felt a little a, a little punitive. I, I, at the same time, Churchill has put an unbelievable amount of effort and expense into the building, remodeling the paddock where I'm mm -hmm. coming to you from. Uh, Two hundred million dollars to to completely reimagine uh, this section of the racetrack. And, and this sesquicentennial, this 150th Derby, I, I think in part that while they said that, that Baffert wasn't contrite enough, that he hadn't apologized and taken responsibility, I, I think deep down they just wanted to avoid a situation hmm. where Baffert, Baffert's presence overshadowed this 150th celebration, really. And you can understand their thinking on that topic. Uh, Bob Baffert and I talked while I was in California uh, around the, the Santa Anita Derby for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. he, he wants to participate in this race. He, he wants a chance to reestablish a, a, whatever measure of confidence in him and trust that, that can be, you know, that can be, you know, re, re gleaned. Yeah. Um, and he, he would, he would be grateful for a chance, uh, you know, to prove himself to Churchill and, and to the people who have, have been, you know, in, in, in to some degree, uh, understandably, uh, disgusted with the things that transpired. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it would be better, not just for Baffert, not just for Churchill. It, it, it would be better for the whole game, uh, yes. for the Medina spirit uh, situation to, to be put in the past and to go forward. Yeah. This game is always best when there's controversy and, and when there's uh, things that, that are sometimes identified as crises. Mm. It, it, it's always best you know, for us to look forward as an industry. And uh, that, that's certainly the case with, with, with this saga, which is probably the best way to, to term <laughs> what, it, what it's been. Uh, and, and hopefully uh, Bob Baffert and his clients uh, who stuck by him this year, they, they weren't going to transfer their horses. Uh, hopefully they, they get a chance to participate uh, and it would, be, it would be good for everybody. Yeah, and I mean, I know race fans, and I can't speak for all of them, but I think I speak as one to say it's just better to have him in the game, like you said. I mean, it, especially when it comes to the the uh, Kentucky Derby, it seems like it's missing, but I certainly understand where it's going, and it's good to hear maybe that we'll get some progress on that one as well. Again, Mike Bick hosts at the races every weekday, 9 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM. This Saturday, do not miss his race lead-in show, three-hour pre-race show from Churchill downs at 2 p.m. Eastern leading into the Kentucky Derby on Sirius XM 85. Steve, thank you so much for being generous with your time. We know how busy you are and enjoy the races and we'll talk to you, I'm sure, down the line. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Steve.